Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Morion Glory video. In today's episode, we will be doing another tournament after action report. I know it's been a long time since we did one of these. The last one I did was actually back in 9th edition, but 10th edition is here. The balance patch is here, and so I thought it's time to dust off the old Imperial Guard and take them into the Maelstrom of Battle, into the Heart of Darkness, into a tournament setting. And I just want to say I am so excited about talking to you guys today because I was running my pure infantry guard. Now, if you've not seen one of my videos before, you've not been following me for a long time, you might not know, but I am an infantry guard commander at heart. I've been doing it since 5th edition, and I like trying out other stuff, but always my favorite playstyle has just been wave after wave of men just throwing them into the enemy, driving them, bringing things down with bayonets and lasguns. That's just what I like to do. And at the beginning of every edition, when I go to a tournament, I always take my pure infantry guard first. Whether it's good or bad, it's just something I like to do. And it was so much fun. I am calling it now. I'm making a bold Morian Glory statement right here. I think that pure infantry guard is genuinely meta and genuinely top tier competitive. I know, I know, controversial stuff, but let me take you through the games that I played, how it all panned out. And by the end of it, I think you're going to be convinced. So without further ado, let's fix bayonets, equip bayonets, and charge right into today's episode. So the first thing that I want to say is a massive thank you to Just Play Games for hosting the event. I've been to several of their events before and they're always top notch. Really well organized, plenty of TOs for the size of the event. They've always got lots of experienced players that are also able to help out. The gaming space is nice and clean and tidy. They sell food and drink and they've even got a pretty decent store as well. So you can browse and peruse and pick yourselves up some treats if you want to. This was no exception. The entire day was just fantastic and I had no issues whatsoever. Round timings were good, terrain was good, terrain maps were good. Everything was just top notch from start to finish. So massive thank you to Just Play Games. And if you're ever thinking of going to a one day RTT, I can't recommend their Naughty K series enough. They've actually started doing some midweek tournaments as well. So not only can you go to things at the weekend, but you can also go during the week if you've got a spare day. And I also want to say a big thank you to all of my opponents. Every single one of them was an officer and a gentleman, a gentleman and a scholar. There were no shenanigans, there were no gotchas. Everything was played as intended. Everything was played above board. They were also really fun and friendly and every single one of them was really complimentary about the army and they really got into the vibe of it. They were encouraging the bayonet charges and all that great stuff. So thank you guys. You made it one of the best tournaments that I've been to in a long time. But what army was I going to take into this wretched hive of scum and villainy? Well, it was, of course, the infantry corps. Every day in the corps is like a day on the farm. Every paycheck of fortune, every meal a banquet, every formation a parade. I love the corps. I was running my Mordian 50th Rifles, which is my pure infantry guard army. Now, I've actually done a video on this army in detail going through exactly all the unit choices that I took and the weapon options and all that kind of good stuff. So what I will do is make sure there's a link to that either at the end of this video or there'll be one down in the description or a pinned comment. Essentially, to give you the brief rundown of it, I had five squads of Death Corps of Krieg. Each one of these squads was 20 man large. Each squad had a medipack, two plasma guns, no vox casters, two melter guns, two grenade launchers, and each sergeant had a plasma pistol and power sword. Three of these Death Corps Krieg units were led by Death Corps Marshals, each one with the best free war gear that they get. And I also had two platoon command squads. Each platoon command squad 
had a officer with a plasma pistol and a power fist. We had a medic, a master vox, a regimental standard, and a melter gun. So essentially, I've got 100 death core of Krieg. Every single one of those squads has an officer that can support them with orders. And there's also some form of feel no pain in there, either a 5 plus feel no pain from the marshal or 6 of feel no pain from the command squad. On top of this, I had 40 Katachan jungle fighters, two 20 man squads, each one with all the flamers and vox casters that you can get. They were supported by Strachan. Yes, it's only one officer to support two squads, but he can do two orders. And also, he's an absolute beast in combat as well, giving me just a little bit of punch if things start getting up close and personal. Finally, we had the fire support squads, and I had four infantry squads, each one 20 man strong, each one double plasma, plasma pistol power sword on the sergeants, and also there were three of them which had double las cannon, and one of them which had double auto cannon. The point of these squads was to just give me some way of being able to engage at a range further than 24 inches. Without those las cannons and auto cannons, I'm basically limited to taking pot shots at 24 inch range, I get a couple of plasma, a couple of grenade launch from my Kriegers, a few lads guns, but by having just a bit of seasoning of some proper heavy weapons, I was able to actually reach out and do some damage from quite a bit further away. And often that really allowed me to soften the enemy up with a few big lads cannon blasts where they could then be finished off by the smorgasbord of special weapons that are crammed into every other unit. Supporting the four infantry squads, we had Creed. She can do two orders, which is great. And also I can get three fields of fire off as well. And the squad she's leading can receive two orders as well. So it's just, she's very useful, very good utility character. And then I had a Cajun Castellum. And then I had a Commissar. Now the Commissar realistically was shoved in there because I had 30 points left over. But also I figured if I stuck him in a blob that was near the middle of the army, then he would be able to affect as many units as possible with his 12-inch summary execution. Spoiler alert, the Commissar did absolutely nothing the entire tournament, never got to bother with his summary execution because people basically either wiped out a blob or they didn't. I think I took a total of maybe three or four battle shock tests across the entire army, across the entire tournament. Last but certainly not least, I ended up actually making a change to the list. I originally had another 20-man fire support score with autocannons. I ended up dropping that and instead using the points that I saved from dropping that unit and another Caden Castellan that I had with Grand Strategist. Just got rid of both of those and I was able to take three five-man Scion squads. Now, these were invaluable. I may forget to mention them throughout the tournament, but basically every single game these guys were the things that were scoring me those hard to get secondaries things like behind enemy lines or deployed teleporter homer stuff that my army trying to foot slog up the board just wouldn't be able to do so for me the unsung heroes of this list absolutely were the scions and like i said if i do forget to mention the exploits just assume that when i say i'm scoring secondaries well it's pretty much because of these guys in total, I was running 251 infantry. The general game plan was to have the Katachans scout move forward at the beginning of the game. That way, they can either screen out or block enemy charges. They're going to be aggressive. Or if I get first turn, I can just get them onto objectives early on, no problem. Behind that was going to come the main assault wave, which is going to be the Death Corps of Krieg. And behind that, we had the rear echelon, which were going to be the infantry squads that would move into firing positions, start laying down heavy weapons fire. And if the front rank start getting a bit thin they could push on and help keep the line firm but with all of that said now let us go on to the lay of the land the part of the video where i like to talk about the format the terrain and how competitive the whole thing was so we'll begin with the format it was a one day three round tournament your classic rtt it was a 2000 point event and it was using the Leviathan missions, although they were preset. So you had things like the terrain maps were set and you had the missions were set and the twist was set. So there's no randomization. As for the terrain, it was pretty standard. There were lots of ruins and there were some craters and some pseudo forests. 
essentially it was quite dense but not too dense this is something that i noticed about just play events they have a decent amount of terrain but they're not completely chocker blocking the entire thing you'll have each player's deployment zone will have on average two to three ruins and you'll see that in the pictures these ruins did have the bottom floor windows blocked off so there was no risk of being just seen through and blown off the table if you're trying to hide inside them uh, but what you tend to find is there's these big line of sight blocking things in the middle but the flanks are a little bit more open perhaps you'll benefit from cover but that's about as good as it gets i actually really like this style of terrain i think it's really really good for 10th edition i think we see a lot of tournaments now that focus overly on ruins and overly on l-shaped ruins on perfect bases but i think you want to have a mixture you want to have some l shapes and you want to have some things which are just the equivalent of forests and craters that give you the benefit of cover what i like about this terrain is that it means if you go down the center which is the most direct route you will have the most cover but there's typically only sort of one objective there so indirect fire is still very very important but when you're going around the flanks, it's a little bit more open, so it's a bit riskier. But that's where the firing angles are, and it also means that, well, typically there's two objectives on the flanks, right? So more risk, more reward. And that's how I think terrain should be. And the last thing to mention is the competitiveness of the whole thing. And I would say that it was a tournament. It was a competitive event. People were putting their best foot forward. They were bringing the best list that they could build and the player skill was pretty high. There was no one there that I could see that had never played a game of 40k before. Everyone that I saw were tournament veterans, even if they had not been in a few months like myself. They had been to events before. They weren't total noobs. And so the list lethalness was pretty high and the player skill was also uh, very respectable. But now, let us march into game number one. And my first opponent was a lovely chap called Ben, and he was running Dark Angels. Now, up until before the balanced data slate, Dark Angels were a decent Marine chapter, but Marines as a whole were kind of struggling. After the balanced data slate, Dark Angels are considered by many to be one of, if not the best, Marine chapter. So this was quite a spicy matchup for me from the beginning, especially considering that Ben actually had quite a lot of anti-infantry. Ben's list consisted of an Apothecary Biologus with the Bolt Discipline Enhancement, a big six-man Aggressor Squad with all of the Dakar, that thing was painful. We then had an attack bike with a heavy bolter and twin bolt gun. Just more Dakar. Then we had two Centurion assault squads. Each one with the twin flamer and the Centurion bolter. So there's more Dakar there. Then we had a giant block of 10 Deathwing Knights. Which are really difficult. <laughs> They're really tough. They reduce damage. They're all four wounds. We then had three Predator Destructors. With the auto cannons, storm bolters, two large cannons on each one, and a hunter killer missile. So again, there's a lot of auto cannons there, a decent volume of fire. They get bonuses for shooting infantry, and the flat damage three is basically going to override my feel no pain. Two storm speeder thunderstrikes with the storm fury missiles, thunderstrike last talons, and Icarus rocket pods, and then he had a Calidus assassin and an Evessa assassin. On paper, this was quite a difficult list for me to face because not only has he got quite a lot of armor, five vehicles, all of which my melters and my plasma and all my special weapons only wound on fives. I've only got a handful of lads cannons that can wound them any more reliably. But also he's got quite a lot of anti-infantry and if it's not a vehicle, it's a very heavy infantry choice. Terminators are, with their tuba save are gonna bounce my lads guns. Um, and the Centurions and the Aggressors are all toughness 6 or higher, which again means that my Lazcans will be winning on 6s. I'm just fishing for 5s and 6s pretty much the entire game, whether it's against infantry or against vehicles. But I was not perturbed, for I am an officer in his Imperial Guard, and I was going to show these Dark Angels who the Emperor's true finest was. I had a mission and I was going to complete it. 
Speaking of mission, it was supply drop. So there are three objectives across the middle and over the course of the game that reduces down to one as they eventually get picked up. You've got like an alpha objective and an omega objective. The deployment was Dawn of War and the twist to the mission rule was Vox Static. Now for my deployment, I had 40 Death Corps Krieg on my left flank, supported by a 20-man infantry blob with Castellum. On the right flank, I had another 20-man Death Corps Krieg squad and a 20-man infantry squad, and they were supported by a command squad. And then in the middle was, at the very front, I had my Catachans of Strachan. They were going to form a two-line screen where they'd scout move forward, spread out as much as possible. The enemy can chew through the first screen, but then they've still got the second screen to deal with. If they don't chew through the first screen, the second screen with Strachan can start countercharging them. And then behind that, we had two more infantry squads with the last cannons and two more Death Corps Krieg. I was quite center focused. And that's because the central objective was the main one, the one that was going to be left at the end of the game. As for my esteemed and worthy opponent, Ben was able to pretty much hide everything out of line of sight. I couldn't do that because I've got too many men, but he was able to hide everything out of line of sight. And in the center, he had his Deathwing Nightbrick. On what would be my right hand flank, he had his three Predators. Uh, and then on the left flank, he had the aggressors and the land speeders. And then in reserve, he had his two Centurion squads. And the Calidus Assassin was just bimbling around the backfield. The attack bike was sort of holding the back objective and screening out. And then the Avesa was on my left hand flank with the aggressors and storm speeders. Once everything was deployed, we rolled first turn and I got it. And my first turn was incredibly quick. I told every single one of my squads to take cover. So now they're all on a four plus save with the benefit of cover. So they're on a three plus save. Most of them have got feel no pain as well. I then scout moved all of my Catachans forward. The first rank making it onto the middle objective, the second rank just behind it. And then we had on my left hand flank, the 40 Death Corps Free guys advance and they made it onto the objective. Not quite all of them, but a lot of them made it onto the objective. And then on my right flank, I pushed forward with my 20 man last cannon squad and also the Death Corps Creek. Although unfortunately with some low advance rolls, neither of those squads made it onto the objective. But essentially at the end of my first turn, I've got two objectives locked down. I'm threatening a third one, and I've essentially dumped 120 Guardsmen into the middle board. I've completely swarmed it, and I'm also very, very durable as well. But I couldn't see anything, so I couldn't shoot anything, and that was my turn. The only thing of note to mention is I drew my two objective cards. I can't remember what they were, but what I can tell you is that I couldn't score either one of them, which was a little bit of a pisser. Because then when it came over to my opponent, Ben pulled his first two cards and was able to score both of them. Which was... <laughs> oh, you know, when the, you know when you get that feeling when you're like, oh god, I'm going to have the bad cards, they're going to have the good cards, it's just going to fall that way. Oh. Fortunately, it didn't end up being like that too much. But basically, in Ben's turn, he then moves his Predators out, they all come out from behind line of sight, they aggressively move forward, and he's like, right, I'm gonna just blow away one of your blobs. And I'm thinking to myself, really? You're gonna blow away like a full blob? He's like, yeah, well, they've got rapid fire auto cannons, and they're extra AP this, and they've got all the DAC and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm a bit worried. They, they seem like they've got a lot of anti-infantry capability. Um, let's see what they can do. And they proceed to unload into the Laz Cannon Infantry Squad, which I was very happy about because that particular Laz Cannon Squad on the flank was just unsupported. It was essentially just a bit of a, a, bit of a cannon fodder, really. But because it had the Laz Cannons in there, it looked quite threatening, especially against his Predators. So I was quite happy that uh, Ben ended up targeting it. It was a bit of a, a, bit of a bait, if I, if I will admit. So all of these Auto Cannons unload, but this squad didn't have Oath of Moment on it. And... 
I'm on a three up save, even with those predators AP minus two, I'm on a five up save. Not every shot hits, there's still ones fail to wound, and once the dust is cleared and the auto cannons have stopped pom poming at me, the last cannons have fired. I think they split fire maybe, but I can't remember. I had taken eight or nine casualties from three predator destructors. Which was nice. <laughs> oh my days. That's when I started to realize that my opponent didn't quite have as much anti-infantry as I thought. Because this was the biggest, bestest anti-infantry that he had. It was the auto cannons, which was the ones that I was worried about the most because they had the volume with the rapid fire. But without Oath of Moment, Marines just hitting on threes and then wounding on twos. But then I've got a five-up save. There's a lot of barriers there, and if my opponent rolls one or two uh, ones or twos when he's wanting to hit, and then he rolls a couple of ones when he's wanting to wound, and then I make a few five up saves, suddenly the amount of damage these things are doing is actually quite lackluster. And it turned out that the most effective anti infantry weapon on those Predator Destructors was actually the Hunter Killer Missiles and the Last Cannons, because that's what my opponent needed to, to do, just punch through my, my stupid saves that I had. In the center, the Deathwing Knights move forward. They advance, they're still able to charge because my opponent has popped the Assault Doctrine and he just obliterates 20 Catachans in the middle, but that's fine. That's what they were there for. They were unsupported, there was no Strachan, and now they're out and exposed in the middle of the board, facing down 80 infantry, 100 infantry if you include Strachan's mob. So I'm going to counterattack them hard. And on the left hand flank, the aggressors come out to play, but they've been put into devastated doctrine. So they move in advance and they're still able to shoot, but they're not able to charge. This is really important because my opponent puts Oath of Moment on one of the 20 man Krieg squads that's holding the objective, and the aggressors are able to blow it away. But the other 20-man Greek squad takes some firepower, but survives and can't be counterattacked because the aggressors advanced. So I'm actually able to hold on to a middle objective at the end of turn battle round one, which is cool because it means going into battle round two, I'm actually going to score some primary. But for me, the main takeaway from turn one was I now had the measure of my opponent's army. I knew those Predators weren't anywhere near as much anti-infantry as I'd feared. I knew the Deathwing Knights were very, very punchy, but I could screen them out so they could only really kill one blob a turn, and I'm happy to feed them that to keep them busy. And I'm hopefully about to start pouring ungodly amounts of firepower into them. And the Aggressors were also a hell of a lot of anti-infantry, but without Oath of Moment, I suspected that their capabilities were going to drastically reduce. It then swings over to my turn two. On my right hand flank, I bring in the reinforcements of the Death Corps of Krieg. I should have mentioned the squad that had died on the left hand flank. That's what I used my 2CP for reinforcements on. I didn't reinforcements the Catachans that died in the center because they're totally sacrificial. So my reinforcements came in. I've got the remnants of the infantry squad with Laz Cannons. I say remnants, there's still about 12 people in that unit. And then I've got a 25-man Death Corps of Krieg unit with a command squad. All of that pushes onto the right-hand objective. And I can actually just skip ahead a little bit here. They all charge in. They charge in and they spend the remainder of the game in combat with the Predators. And the Predators, and in fact one of the land speeders that comes over to try and help out, spend the rest of the game fruitlessly trying to shoot and run over 50 plus guardsmen who were just sat on the objective, just scratching the paint of those tanks. Well, I say scratching the paint, I was able to actually kill the land speeder in combat, which was cool. But I've just got so much objective control over there because I've got the flag, and then I've also got the medipacks and the Kree squads, which are bringing back, you know, two guys per squad, roughly a turn. And so it's just men surrounding tanks trying to pry open hatches, toss grenades in, scratching the paint, doing a bit of this, bringing the land speeder down, but that objective is completely mine for the rest of the game. Over in the center, it was the big brawl of the Deathwing Knights versus about 100 of my infantry. Everyone got take aim, and I just want to bring down as many of these big old Terminators as 
possible. I said to my opponent, if I can trim down about half of them, I'd be happy with that. And Ben was like, well, if you do that, that'll be really impressive because no one else has managed to do that. And I was like, well, my list isn't really designed to damage, but I'm hoping between all the plans and everything that I've got that I'll be able to just chip away at you. And even though I'm basically doing one damage a time because of the way you reduce damage, I've just got a lot of volume, a lot of LAS guns, everything's in rapid fire range. I hope I can just whittle you. I'm whittling, I'm whittling. But I can see that Ben was a little skeptical. <laughs> so what happened was I started unloading and essentially each mob that I fired killed a Terminator. So one of the last cannon squads opened up, that killed a Terminator. Another one opened up, that killed a Terminator. I then had another one of my Kriegs was opened up, that killed a Terminator. And then another one opened up, that killed a Terminator. And then Strachan's mob opened up and they were actually able just to through pure volume of flamer attack, Strachan's plasma pistol, and a boatload of lance guns, I was actually able to kill another one as well and wound another. So what's actually happened is I have taken out five of these Terminators and wounded another one, taken, taken out five and a half essentially, and then I charge him. And you can see Ben's like, wait, what? Why are you charging me? And I'm like, well... I've got Strachan in there, and he's a little bit of a beast. I know you're going to reduce him down to damage one, but with four year olds to hit, four year olds to wound, and AP3, even if you do armor of contempt, them, I still think I can get another Terminator. And if I can get another Terminator, that's really big because then you're down to four. And I'm, if you're down to four, you don't physically have enough attacks to blow away the squad in combat. So then you're wrapped up in there, and I've got objective control on the objective. And so, Strachan, the one million credit man, runs in there, winding up his big old bionic power fist with Devil's Claw, and he goes berserk. He gets all hits, he gets all wounds, smacks those Terminators down onto their fourth and vulnerable save, and they just can't make them. I don't know if they, they just were laughing at the fact that this puny human had dared to threaten them, their, their pure Astartes form. I don't know, but they underestimated Strachan, old Iron Hand, and he actually ends up cutting down the injured Terminator, putting the squad down to just four members, and he puts another wound or two on the next Terminator, which is then brought down through pure volume of Katachan AP minus one attacks. Cause sure, I'm only wounding on fives and I'm only AP minus one, but cause Strachan's leading the squad, there's loads of lethal hits going around. So eventually I just pile on all of these, this Katachan fangs and rifle butts and some people that are just jumping on top and trying to like find cracks and seams in the helmets, get a shiv in there. And I actually bring down another Terminator, which means in one turn, this 10 man brick of Deathwing Knights, the crux of my opponent's army, his death ball, this unit is worth almost a quarter of his entire list, is reduced by 70%. And they're now wrapped up with a Strachan squad, and that makes them combat ineffective. But we're not done yet, because we've still got the left flank. The infantry squad with auto cannons that were supporting over there had moved out. And between them and the rest of the Krieg blob, which had got quite lucky on the amount of models that had been able to heal back into it, so that was actually looking very healthy, were able to reduce the aggressors down to just three, halving that unit as well. And so essentially the two big anti-infantry threats on the board are either half as effective or just really not doing very much anymore at all. In response, in my opponent's turn two, Ben brings on both of his Centurion squads. Now, one of them comes on in the backfield, and the reason for that is he's setting up for a turn five push onto the middle objective because he can move and he can advance, and so he's got ways of being able to actually get up there relatively quickly, but he doesn't want to just bring them on into a shooting gallery, so that was quite a clever move by him. And then over on the left hand flank the other centurions come in now between their shooting and the aggressor shooting 
they're able to blow away the 20 man infantry squad with auto cannons which means over on the left hand flank i actually just have the remnants of that creek blob now the aggressors make the charge in against the creek blob but they're not able to completely wipe them out also the avessa assassin goes in as well and the avessa completely flubs it he doesn't kill a single krieger he gets like one wound through which i then just make my feel no pain on in response i'm able to then kill the avessa assassin in combat that's right the kriegers assassinated the assassin because they're now below half strength it basically consists of the death corps marshal the two sergeants the medipack guy and one or two special weapons i actually am getting plus one to hit and i'm getting plus one to wound and so the power swords are wounding the assassin on threes and there's like eight power sword attacks there between the captain and the uh, and the sergeants so i'm able to bring down the avessa most of the way and the final bayonets managed to find a chink in his armor and we managed to put that psychopath into the ground so no matter what happened at that point i was gonna have a moral victory because i actually took an avessa sass now in combat with just balls and bayonets but what was really important about this whole thing is because my opponent had failed to wipe me out on that side, because all of his infantry is just objective control one, I still control the left flank going into my turn three. And I now control the right flank for the rest of the game. So that's primary points locked down for me there. And then in the center, he's mobbed by Strachan's unit. Although to be fair, between their attacks some spare firepower and that attacks back in my turn two some spare firepower that i whittled them sort of turn one and then their attacks again in turn three they were actually able to get through most of strachan's mob although i think strachan was able to get away with it so he has taken me off the middle objective but i'm controlling both of the flanks now it comes over to my turn three the remaining Deathwing Knights get brought down. The remaining Aggressors get brought down. The Centurions that are on that left flank get brought down. Because now I start redirecting the Death Corps Creek that were in the center up towards uh, the left hand flank. Between the shooting and some very uh, lucky long bomb charges, I'm able to kill the Centurions. Then bayonet the remaining Aggressors to death. And so at the end of my turn three... I'm still struggling on secondaries. I'm not going to lie. I've probably only scored like one secondary each turn. And they've been fairly weak secondaries. But in terms of primary, I've absolutely smashed it. My opponent, I think, got something like nine primary at the end of, uh, of, at the end of uh, turn three. But, and that might be, it might have even been less than that. But my opponent is absolutely smashing it on secondaries. He's got two big ones in the bank every single turn so what happens is it gets to my opponent's turn three he uh, does a bit more shooting starts maneuvering his remaining centurions forward the uh, remaining land speeders coming around the attack bites coming around he's, he's scraping together the remnants but it gets my my opponent's turn three he does some scattered damage everywhere but not really enough to uh to really cause any permanent casualties but then the to comes over to us and says oh you guys have got 11 minutes left and I look at my opponent and say, well, we've both had an equal amount of turns now. Um, we can stop the game here if you want. And the TO is like, well, you've got uh, your lunch. So you can play into your lunch if you want to. And I just say to my opponent, what is the score right now? My opponent says, uh, Ben says, it's 50 to the guard. It's 49 to uh, the Dark Angels. And I said, well, it's that's... A draw right because we're playing wtc rules where you have to win by at least five points to get the victory and ben's like yeah it, it'll be a draw i said well, you know what why don't why don't we call it there and ben was like are you sure mate and i was like yeah well to be honest like being brutally honest with myself i played very slowly that game i was very tired i'd only had about four hours sleep i've not had any breakfast i was unpracticed with the army i definitely took up more of the three hour round i said i said this to ben i said this to Tio, like you had a chess clock there 
you were kind enough not to just instantly put me on it when you saw the army I was running. So if I wanted to win, I should have just played quicker. And that's a lesson for me to learn. If this had been a normal game of 40k, I would have won by a point. It's WTC. I'm going to get a draw. We can both walk away with the heads held high. And frankly, I don't want to play during my lunch because I want to use my lunch, go out, get a drink, get some energy in me, you know, get, get some food in me so that after lunch I can go in and I'll be fully operational for games two and games three. So the first round was uh, a draw, but as me and Ben were packing up our armies and getting ready for lunch and getting ready for the next round, Ben was like, you definitely would have won if we'd, if we'd carried that on there. And I was like, yeah, but the round was over. We would both had three turns. That was fair. And um, if I, like I said, if I wanted to win, I, I would have I should have played quicker. But he just said, you were, you were going to win because you just sit on those three middle objectives after the game. I can't threaten them. You've got reinforcements coming in. And so you just sit there. And he said, probably you would have got a sort of 80, 90 point win by the end of it. And I was like, well, you know what? It, it's it's all fine. You know what I mean, mate? We've put the scores in now. Uh, and like I said, I'm happy to walk away with what was a win under normal circumstances and a draw under WTC. But for me, that was a real lesson learned because I was very rusty and I did make a lot of mistakes. I did take my time over things. But fortunately, going into game number two game number three we got to turn five every single time so it just i wanted to highlight this though and the reason i've kind of flogged the said horse and i've kind of over egged this point is if you're going to run a pure infantry army like this make sure you've had a good night's sleep make sure you've had your breakfast but most importantly make sure you've practiced because most of that first game the reason i was slow is i was i didn't know exactly what my army could do and i wasn't exactly sure how much punishment they could take Going into game two and game three, I was lightning fast. I finished both of those games with like half an hour to spare. That was getting to turn five in both cases as well. But that was the first game. And after that, I got lunch. I had a big sandwich and I had a, a big chocolate bar. And I made sure that I had a big sugary full fat Pepsi so that I was fully switched on, splashed some cold water in my face, got some fresh air. And going into game two, I was 100% switched on, 100% alert and game number two was against Stee and his dark angels dark angels again can you tell that dark angels are the best marine faction yet guys <laughs> oh my god every space room player that was there was running their space screens whatever flavor or color they were as dark angels as far as i could tell it wasn't just the two people that i had played against um now Steve's list was a little bit different to ben's he had the lion and let me tell you boys the lion is an absolute beast he's really he he was lethal he was able to single-handedly wipe out a blob on his own i don't know how competitive he, he's meant to be but I actually found out of all of the units that I faced over the course of the tournament, he was the only one that could single-handedly just cut through an infantry blob without breaking a sweat. But the total list was Azrael, Captain Terminator Armor, Lieutenant with Combi Weapon, Lion L. Johnson, and a Primaris Apothecary with the enhancement Stubborn Tenacity. He then had a big... 10-man squad of Deathring Terminators. This was a Deathring Command Squad, and they had Storm Shields and Storm Bolters and Thun Hammers. They were completely dialed up to the nines. It's interesting how I've played two Dark Angel armies, and both of them have featured, one form or another, a mega blob of Terminators. Uh, but, then, but Steve wasn't done because he had five more Terminators after that. And these were the proper Deathwing Knights as well. So I'm facing 15 Terminators, even more than last time, dialed up. And then he had a full 10-man Hellblaster squad. And these were being led by the Apothecary and Azrael. And they had an Inceptor squad, which was just for dropping into an objective, but a bit of plasma as well. He had three Ravenwing Black Knights, which were also good for running around and doing objectives. And then he had a Whirlwind. He had some indirect fire, which you can't complain about too much. Always good to have a little bit of that, uh, of that artillery in your list. 
The mission for game number two was Vital Ground. This is basically where the objective of the middle goes away and just fighting over the two in no man's land. The deployment was Crucible of Battle, which is the table corner deployment essentially. And then you have got minefields for the mission rule. I love minefields, but it never comes up or does anything. And that was the case in this game as well. My deployment was brutally simple. I took 80 Kriegers and I put them on the Northern flank. They were going to march onto the objective up there and they were going to hold it. And then I took my 20 Kachans, my remaining, my 40 Kachans, sorry, my remaining 20 Kriegers and then an infantry blob, which was another 80 infantry, and I sent those down south to do exactly the same thing. My remaining three infantry squads were to screen out from any potential deep strikers because he did put his Deathwing Knights in reserve and he also had his Inceptors in reserve as well. As for the rest of Steve's deployment, Azrael, the Apothecary and the Hellblasters went towards the south and the bikes were in the extreme south. They were going to try and take that objective away from Strachan. And then the big old Terminator blob of Doom and the Lieutenant were in the north and they were going to try and take on the company of Death Corps of Krieg. The Lion was in the middle and... He was going to go down the middle. His plan was to essentially send him forward, and if the left needed help, he could send him left, and the right needed help, he could then send him right. We then got to turn one, and Steve won the roll off. It was a pretty quiet turn one. The Hellblasters moved behind some line of sight blocking terrain, so I couldn't see them at all, but they were in a perfect position from the middle of the board to dive out onto the southern objective if I decided to go for it early. And then the big block of death moved a little bit from its deployment out into no man's land to try and start threatening uh, that northern objective. The lion stuck in the middle, waiting to see what I would do, and the bike stuck out of line of sight as well as a good counter-attacking force. There was some scattered firepower coming from the Dark Angels, but a lot of it was a pitter-patter of long-range Storm Bolter and a handful of Cyclone missile launchers. I think I lost half of an infantry blob, and that was really it. And that was my opponent's turn one. Coming over to the guard first turn, Strachan had Scout moved forward with the other cast chance, and so when it came to my turn, I then moved them and took cover with them and advanced them and they were able to get 40 bodies onto that southern objective. And I thought 40 bodies is pretty reliable. That should be able to lock that down. Then in the north, I moved my Kriegers forward and I went for a mixture of orders. One of the squads got move, move, move and they just dived onto the objective as far as they could go. One of the squads that was at the front that had taken a casualty or two from some spare bolts of firepower, I chose not to use my medipack to bring a guy back, because it was just a couple of riflemen, and therefore they had plus ones hit already. So they got take cover as their order, and the remaining Kriegers that were moving up behind that screen all had um, take aim. So I had one blob of Kriegers at the front that was hitting on threes anyway with a three plus save because of the benefit of cover and take cover because there's a bit of a forest in the way. And then the remaining Kriegers behind were hitting on threes as well. So that essentially my, I was kind of having my cake and eating it. I was able to benefit from cover and also be durable and have the shooty shooty that I wanted. And speaking of shooty, uh, it was all right. Yeah, can't complain. Between the last cannons moving and shooting, you know, getting lucky on some of the fours there, um, and the various long range and short range plasma guns and whatnot, and melt and grenade launcher, we end up whittling down the main death ball by five. Isn't too bad at all. I think I actually took out six of them in total, but there was an apothecary in the squad, so he brought one back. So at the start of turn two, there were five Terminators and the captain in there. As for secondaries, it was a little bit of a reversal from last time. I was able to score both of mine in turn one, but Steve, he was unlucky. He drew a card that he could do, but only get like two points on it first turn and then he drew another one which he, he couldn't achieve and he had to essentially burn at the end of, end of the turn so I was a little bit ahead on 
secondary. And when it came to primary, I'm on both objectives in the middle and Steve's just got his home one that he's holding with his whirlwind. So he gets two primary points there. It then comes over to the pain train, right? It's where the damage is going to start coming in. In the south, Azrael and co and Hellblasters pop out of the wall that have been hiding behind and they unleash onto the Catachans. They blow away one of the Catachan units with firepower, just completely gone. I actually end up using reinforcements on those Catachans because uh, I actually had the CP to do so. And it only cost me one CP as well because the Vox Casters, that was good. And then uh, Azrael and co charge into Strachan's mob, which are basically undamaged. Now they fight first, but they're just Marines. So they've got like three attacks each, but there's like no AP worth of damn there. Um, I believe I was either moving move or I was take cover, but I can't remember. But I get lucky on my saves. And so out of these 10 Hellblasters and Azrael, I still have about seven or eight Catachans and Strachan left. And Strachan, as always, goes bonkers. Even with their invulnerable save from Azrael, Strachan picks up four of the Hell Blasters on his own, and the remaining Catachans are able to kill a fifth one. Bear in mind, that's in my opponent's turn. He charged me. I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. So that was nice. And then in the north, his Terminator blob fails its charge. Now, admittedly, it was a 10 inch charge or a nine inch charge, but we had plus one. It, he doesn't make it. Even with the CP reroll, he rolls like a five or a six both times. And the lion was gonna go for a long 11 inch charge, but doesn't quite make it either. It comes over to my turn too. I draw my secondaries. I can score both of them. They're both actually ones uh, uh, relate to being in my opponent's deployment zone. I think one of them is deployed teleporter home and the other one is behind enemy lines. So I just drop two sound squads in there straight away. One of them deploys teleporter home and one of them just chills there, just getting behind enemy lines. So that was good. And then it comes over to my turn to firepower. Unfortunately for my opponent, he has kind of whittled a few casualties from several squads. He's not done a huge amount of concentrated damage. And between that and the fact that I'd overcharged a lot of my plasma, essentially at this point, all of my Krieg squads are hitting on twos, which is absolutely brutal. Melter gun, plasma gun, plasma pistol, grenade launcher, las gun, las pistol, flame. Bayonet, everything gets thrown into the mix. And at the end of my turn two, the Hell Blasters have been wiped out, although Azrael and the Apothecary were still knocking about. And then the giant blob of Terminators in the north is brought down as well. So my opponent at the end of battle round two, and he went first, has got the Lion, five Deathwing Knights and the Interceptors or Interceptors. Oh, and he's got three bikers bimbling around somewhere and he's got a Whirlwind. But he's lost his two big 10-man units. It feels like he's got maybe five, six, a dozen or so models left on the board. It goes over to turn three. My opponents can score no primary part. Oh, he can't even score his own. Forgot to say, the squad of science that deep struck down in my turn two made the long distance charge. They're OC5, the whirlwind's only OC3. So he doesn't even get any primary, not even his own home objective in turn in his turn three. So turn three, he scores no primary. He draws his cards. He can score one of them, and that's it. And he goes in, he finishes off Strachan with the bikers and Azriel, the lion goes in and finishes off a uh, and, and completely wipes out a 20-man squad of Krieg single-handedly, which I then reinforcements. Um, but that's it. That's his entire turn. Finishes off maybe 30 guardsmen. 
Bear in mind that of the four blobs of guardsmen that he has killed, I've managed to bring back three of them because I was able to reinforcements both in the uh, shooting phase and fight phase in turn three because I hadn't spent that much CP because I hadn't reinforcement turn one and uh, I'd saved the CP when I hadn't done it. So I was able to basically reinforce like two or three times. Basically, he's, he's inflicted like 20 to 40 permanent casualties in total. And it's turn three. I'm not, I'm not actually below 200 models at this point. And my turn three, I pick up the rest of his army, apart from the lion. The lion, three plus available save, he just makes everything. Sometimes it just goes that way. But I score all of the points. I score all the primary. Obviously, we do a quick turn four, end of turn four, tabled. And that was game two. I, It blew my mind, like, how resilient my list was. But most importantly, what really stood out to me here and what I'd learned between this game and the last game was whilst I may not have built this list to do damage, it had a surprising amount of firepower. Because every Krieg squad is rocking six plasma shots, two grenade launcher shots, two melter shots, and then a dozen las gun shots. They're hitting on twos. I'm able to use fields of fire thanks to Creed to get the AP on the las guns where I need it. And so I faced off against two armies, which had just so much heavy infantry. Stuff which normally I just struggle against. Last time in 9th edition, when I went against Dark Angels, at the first tournament I was at with the Pure Infantry, I took on the Terminator Blobs. I barely killed a Terminator. Barely fucking killed one. And then this time I faced off against what feels cumulatively like 30, 35 Terminators and Terminator equivalents. Maybe even like 40. And I just wiped them all out. It's insane the amount of firepower that's like sneakily hidden within this list. And if I were to sum it up in one go, in two out of two games at this point, I had either been on track to or I had genuinely accidentally tabled my opponent when that wasn't even part of my game plan. I just wanted to secure primary. That's what the list was meant to do. And lo, we get to game number three. The final game of the day. The final battle. And I take on Rich and his Chaos Knight. So it's the third Chaos Army I've taken on today. Ha ha ha. Take that, Dark Angel players, you shits. Anyway, moving on before the Dark Angels decide that I'm one of the Fallen and decide to get rid of me. Rich was using Chaos Knights and he had a beautifully converted Nurgle knight army. The color scheme was all brown and rusty and desiccated and decay. Every knight was converted with tentacles and bits. He had one of his baby knights like a flying stand because it was hopping all over the place. It just was really a really cool army. The mission for game number three was prime mission was scorched earth. So that's where you've got all the normal objectives, but you can end up burning the objectives if you want to score some points and deny them to your opponent, and then that objective gets taken away. And the deployment was search and destroy, essentially table quarters, big nine-inch circle in the middle where no one can go. And finally, the mission rule was sweep and clear. Sticky objectives. Once you've taken it, it's yours until your opponent goes over there and decides to take it off you. As for Rich's list, he had a Knight Rampager with Heavy Stubber, Chainsword, and Claw. He then had a Knight Tyrant with Volcano Lance, Ectoplasm Decimator, the Missile Launchers, the Feet, the Melter Guns, and the Desecrator Cannon. He then had one, two, three, four War Dog Brigands with the Avenger Chain Cannon and the Demon Breath Spear and Stubbers. And then he had one, two, three War Dog Carnivores with the Havoc Multi Launcher, the Reaper Chain Talon, and the Slaughter Claw. So in total, he had nine knights, seven baby knights, one medium knight, and one very big knight. Going over to deployment, I had most of my Death Corps of Krieg down in the south. And the reason for this is there was a little bit more cover and also the firing angles weren't quite as good. 
And so I figured that I needed infantry that could move out, be quite durable, and absorb the incoming fire, and then my special weapons could go to work and start doing what they had to do. But if I'd put all my lads cannon guys down there, they wouldn't have been durable enough, and also they wouldn't be able to see anything very much at all. So speaking of my... I had one lads cannon squad down there with Creed, but the rest of my infantry squads with the heavy weapons, they were on the northern flank because it was much more open up there and there was great angles. I could always spot a knight. So that was where the shooting gallery was going to take place. In terms of the Catachans, I had one blob in the center southern region and they had no support. They were just going to scout, move forward, whatever happened, and be the first wave. Hopefully the knights will be tempted then to charge them and then they're going to be out in the open. And also it's going to help move block the knights because Rich has something called Knights of Shade, which allows him to move through terrain and move through units as if they're not there. But if he does that, he still has to be able to stay an inch away from me when he moves. So I take my Catatons out of the movement tray and I just spread them out in a really big wide blob whilst also maintaining coherency, making it impossible for him to knights of shade turn one into any useful position over on the left hand flank is where the other catachans go with Strachan, and they're also going to scout move forward but there's a lot less firepower over there that's where most of rich's combat knights are so even though they're going to be a little bit more exposed in the open northern territory they should be okay and if they get to one they'll be able to scout move onto the objective move and move and essentially get out of line of sight and hold the objective which is great as for rich's deployment he puts his daconites down in the south against my krieg and he puts his choppy knights the carnivores and the rampage up in the north and that's going up against uh, a lot of my infantry squads and stuff like that. So interestingly, his DACA was against my Jorbal units and, well, my more combat units, as you could say, with the Kriegers, with the power swords and the special weapons and stuff. And my long range stuff was against his short, short range stuff. So we kind of mirrored each other in our deployment, which is kind of interesting. We then go for the roll-off, and the Imperial Guard seize the initiative. Yes, drive the men. And I do take cover on pretty much everything, apart from the infantry squads with last cannons. Strachan move, move, moves forward, and he manages to get onto that top objective. Great. The Katachan scout move, 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 move forward, and create a huge no-walk zone for the knights. And the Kriegers just move forward, take cover, advance, get as far forward as they can, benefit from cover as much as they can. And yes, I'm exposed, but I think I can take the firepower. I have a smattering of my last cannon shots that go out. I think it's the four last cannons and two auto cannons are able to see one of the shooting knights. And I'm able to reduce it down to a single wound, which is nice, but I don't kill a knight in my first turn. But I have got Catachans onto the middle objective. I've got lots of other infantry that are coming up for a second wave onto the middle objective. And then in the south, I'm not on objective, but I'm pushing like 80 Kriegers that way. So I'm confident that I'll get there. And then in the north, it's actually just Strachan, which is leading the charge, but that's fine. Passing it over to the knight turn one, the three shooting knights in the south, plus the one with all the guns, Volcano Lance, the Battle Cannon, and all that stuff. They're able to uh, injure one of the Krieg blobs, but mostly it takes all of that firepower just to kill one Death Corps of Krieg unit, which I then proceed to spend my 2CP on reinforcements to bring it back. In the center, we have one of the shooty knights and some spare firepower from Havoc launchers and bits and bobs here and there, and they're able to kill the Catachans down to uh, about six infantry but amazingly they hold which means i'm going to have that middle objective um at the end of it going into my turn two which is good more primary points in the north one of the carnivores manages to make a charge into strachan's unit and it proceeds to kill about eight of them but strachan turns around and he's re-rolling all hits and all wounds and he's got lethal hits. And Strachan like turns around and just cuts the number of wounds on this knight in half. Just 
takes half its wounds out single-handedly. And then the remaining Catachans come in and they're able to like chip a wound off it as well, or two, because of Strachan and his lethal hits. So the Carnivore went in and definitely got the worst end of that fight. But hilariously, in the center, the one wound shooty knight charged in against the six Catachans because it's trying to get onto the objective and deny me the primary and it gets no hits. It rolls all ones and twos for trying to kick me with its feet. And in response, the Kajans get five hits, get three wounds. Yes, three wounds, wounding on sixes. Because they've been charged, it's AP minus one, and they're actually able to kill the carnivore. The six Kajans gave the old Kajan kiss to the baby knight, baby! Oh, it was so good. Fair play to Rich. He found it hilarious. He took it in his stride. Other people would have got quite salty about that, but but he loved it. He embraced it. He's like, well, that's what I get for charging a one wound knight. I didn't realize, like, I didn't expect those Catachans to do anything. And I was like, bro, I didn't expect to do anything. They had six attacks. <laughs> There's no way they should have done that. But hey, it's a dice game at the end of the day, right? But like I said, Rich very much took it in a stride. And he he was a he was very much a Chaos Knight player at heart. You know, really just loved the chaos and the meltdown of battle and everything. And he was very impressed by Strachan as well. He's like, wow, that Strachan guy is pretty good in combat. I was like, yeah, he's uh, it's not too bad. And um, I had obviously told uh, Rich that he was there and that Strachan was pretty good. But the thing I found with Strachan is people don't really... Uh, believe that he's good in combat even if you like explain it to them because he's just a guardsman at the end of the day but he's actually an absolute beast in combat and we'll do a little tally at the end of the video going through how much Strachan killed over the course of the event in combat but then it comes back around to his imperial guard and I have a blistering turn much better than I was expecting I'm pulling my secondary cards and I'm able to achieve them both every turn. I'm not struggling on the secondaries, basically. I'm also now sat on a primary objective in the north, a primary objective in the middle, so that's lots of primary points for me there as well. My reinforcement creed come in and I bring them in on the southern flank so that they're able to uh, supplement the firepower against one of the uh, the shooty baby knights that was on the objective down there. And then my Kriegers push forward. They push forward and yes, there is a knight rampager that's out of line of sight, hidden in the middle of the board. Yes, it's going to be able to counterattack them, but that's okay. I've got enough bodies and my main goal for this turn is to whittle down the baby knights, get rid of the fleet. Because once they're gone, a lot of the capability of the list for scoring objectives goes because you don't want to make a big knight sit there like retrieving data or doing something like that, do you? You want it running around doing damage. So I figured if I can kill the baby knights, I can start limiting the capabilities of them, of the enlisted as a whole. Now bear in mind, one had died from being punched by cat chance. Then what happens in the south, my Kriegers unload. And it's just crazy. Like it's really, I get very good with the fives on the wounding. I am hitting on twos with everyone, so that does help. I can feel the fire, so that also helps. But in my turn two, I kill two of the minigun knights that are down in the south and I bring another one down to half wound in the north I'm able to uh, really badly injure the no I actually kill so I kill the carnivore I kill the carnivore with my lance cannons auto can and auto cannons and then the other carnivore that's in combat with Strachan gets, uh, I, I shoot some supporting fire in there because you can shoot into combat with knights now. So I shoot some supporting fire in there and then Strachan is able to finish it off in combat, which is amazing. So at the end of my turn two, I've actually killed five out of, if I'm remembering correctly, two of the minigun knights there, one there. I've killed five out of seven of the baby knights and there's two left, one of which is on half wounds and then there's the two big knights which i haven't even touched but that means the knight army has been cut in half they've gone from nine models to four or three and a half really if you include the damaged one 
This really limits what they're able to do. It goes over to the knight turn two. And they actually do a respectable damage. They pick up the remaining six-man Krieger squad, uh, Katachan squad. And they're also able to um, do a lot of damage to one of my Krieger squads down in the south. And the Knight Rampager makes its presence known and wipes out a Krieg Blob, which I then proceed to reinforcements back in. So I have taken some casualties, but every time I'm losing like two blobs a turn, but I'm reinforcementing one every time. Comes over to my turn three, and Strachan just sits on the middle objective, on the on the top objective. I, I actually forgot it was Scorched Earth. He just sits there, but he's, he's earned a, a little tea break. He's killed a baby knight in combat. Uh, in the middle, I end up bringing the Rampager down to one wound in the shooting phase. And then in the south, I'm able to... Um, finish off the baby knight down there no i don't i bring it down to one wound as well i then charge it i charge him because i, I because it's got one wound left i so i charge the baby knight down there and i'm able to bring it down with a lucky power sword attack manages to find a chink in the armor then in the center i'm like oh what do I do? Do I go for it? Do I go for the charge or not? It's on one wound. And then Richard turns to me and says, mate, it's on one wound and you've got 40 Kriegers there. What would they do? And I was like, you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. Big spareheads, bring it down, men. Bring it down. And I charge him and I'm able to kill the Night Rampage in combat. I take one wound off it. One of the each it's really cool because each one of the squads is led by a dude with a power fist. And I swing the power fist guys first. And one of the officers, the guy with the, the peaked cap, just manages to chip the last wound off the knight. And uh that, that brings it down. And the rampager just falls over. And so at the end of turn three, Rich has got a baby knight left and his tyrant left. And that's it. And I'm doing fine on the primary. He can't he can't score. He can only score like two prime for like holding his back objective or however, however many it is for holding his back objective. And I'm on all the middle points now and he literally doesn't have the OC to do anything about it. So that's that, that's the end of the game. And in three turns I had essentially just destroyed the knight army. Because one of the baby knights just sat there just on its own objective, just doing something. So really, in terms of like assets he had available, it was one tyrant. And this one tyrant is facing down. I've taken maybe 40 permanent casualties at this point, including scattered and half squads, let's say 60 permanent casualties. But I'm still rocking about 200 guardsmen. So it's a knight tyrant versus 200 guardsmen. And so me and Rich look at each other and I'm like, do you wanna play it out? And he's like, nah, mate, it's cool. It's last round of the gay of the day. Like, we'll call it there, and then I can go to the pub early. So I shake his hand, and it was a really, really fun game. And it was a ton of fun. It was just, it was just crazy. Like, I thought I was gonna really struggle against this list. Because it's all tanks. And I have no anti-tank in my list. It's all out of all of the weapons in my army, six of them are above strength nine. I have six anti-tank weapons in my list. Everything else is strength nine. Or any, every special weapon is either strength nine or strength eight. And it's, I don't know how I was doing it. It was just pure volume. Like every Krieg squad was like found like six plasma shots, getting a couple through, getting a good aid launch through. Maybe, you know, that, you know, getting sort of three out of the 10 powerful shots. Each one I was getting like three wounds on. And then it's only a five and vulnerable save, so two of those go through. That's a melter gun. It just chops the knight in half. It was absolutely brutal. The amount of accidental anti-tank that I was able to field. It was bonkers. And so at the end of um, game number three, essentially all of my games had ended on turn three one way or another. And in all cases, I had overwhelmed the opponents through waves upon waves of guys. And uh, Rich and I um, talked out. We just said, look, we'll pull our last set of cards, see what we can get. Uh, we'll work out you know, where the primary would be. And um, we had the end score was 49 to the Knights, something like that. 
and uh, 85 to the guard. So it was a nice big scoring game at the end. All of the games to the guard were pretty big scoring, obviously apart from that first one which got prematurely cut slightly. But yeah, that was the end of game number three. And a little side note here, a little quirky bit, just to let you know how, how bonkers that last game was. Out of the seven knights that I killed, one, two, three, four of them, I finished off in close combat. Draken killed one, one uh, carnivore. The Catachans killed one Daka knight. The Kree killed one Daka knight. And then the tie and then the rampage was brought down in combat by a last turn bayonet charge. <laughs> I don't know. It, like I said, you kind of have to be there to really understand how wacky this game was. But with all of that said, we sadly get to the end of the tournament. But it was only sad because I wanted to keep on playing. I was absolutely buzzing. I would have been ready to play another game that day. I would have been happy to turn up the next day and play two more games before 4K. I was fully on the tournament hype train at that point. And I have to tell you right now, guys, the bug is back. I've been very hesitant about going to tournaments at the beginning of 10th with how crazy the meta have been, how overbearing Eldar have been. But now feels like I've got the bug back and whether Elder are still the top facts or not it just doesn't matter I know that my pure infantry guard is looking really, really strong that's all I've ever wanted from 40k was my infantry to not just be something I had to do to survive the meta but to actually thrive in it and thrive we did because we went undefeated we had a draw and two wins and that meant that we placed fourth overall in the event there were two players that won all three of their games and they came first and second and the guy that I actually drew against on my round one actually ended up coming third i honestly believe this does not take away anything from those players that podium let's just say congratulations to all of those people right now but i honestly believe that if i had been more switched on my game one i'd had more practice i could have podiumed with this list and that was in a tournament that was pretty bloody competitive. There were no, there's like one or two maybe like meme lists, but that's like including my one. There was an alt player there with a the squig off, but he actually did pretty well in the end. But the rest of it was very competitive in a traditional shark tanky kind of place. And I think that if I had just known a bit more, had a bit more practice, I truly, I could have podiumed with it. And that just makes me so happy. Lessons learned from the event. If I was to draw some conclusions, because it's all well and good sitting here, wanking myself off saying, oh, look at me, I won my games. But let's actually take a step back, because I didn't, I, I wasn't perfect. I made a lot of mistakes. And what I would say is I almost felt like the list kind of carried me a little bit. The one thing that I had going for me with this list is it's not the first time that I've run this volume of infantry. If you're thinking of doing this style and you're going for 250 plus infantry, I will just say the biggest barrier you're going to have is the real world logistics of it. Make sure that all your squads are homogenous. So all of my Deathcore Krieg were exactly the same. All of my Catachans were exactly the same. Pretty much all of my infantry were the same apart from one where I took two water cans, but that was the only bit of deviation that I had. So just practicing with it, getting used to transporting that amount of models, getting used to setting them up, getting used to deploying them, moving around. The real world logistics are actually the bigger barrier than the in-game tactics. The in-game tactics, I just felt like, honestly, all I did was just push onto objectives. It kind of felt like I broke 40K a little bit. Like I didn't need to apply a huge amount of like tactical thought. I always just made sure that I brought the Death Corp Creed back as reinforcements if it looked like I was likely to lose one of those. and let the infantry squads die, let the Catachans die. But by and large, it was, where are the primary objectives? First turn, take cover on everything, push on to those objectives. Second turn, now that the enemies come out to have a go at me, switch over from defense to offense and go take aim on everyone and blast them off the table. That was basically the game plan that I, I had that was what I theory crafted, and that was all the tactical thought that kind of went into it. Just delete one target, concentrate fire when that's gone, move on to the next. Don't split fire, don't mess around, just brutally simple. Push forward, delete one unit at a time. That was pretty much the entire tactic. So I would say in a funny sort of way, if you have these models and you're familiar with pure infantry, or you have the capability of getting practice with it and getting familiar and efficient with using the list i think it could be really really powerful i genuinely think no word of a lie 
that this kind of list could be meta shaping. Now, I'm not saying it's going to become the meta. I still think we're probably heading towards... A... There's some debate right now whether we're entering a horde meta or not. I think it could go either way. But I think what's going to happen, if I'm going to be honest, is guard infantry lists, if they become prominent enough, if the barrier to entry in terms of getting the models together, because obviously you've got to buy all those models, is lowered. A lot of tournaments will allow you to use third-party things, so you could go to, like, War Games Atlantic and buy boxes of, like, 30 blokes for, like, 20 quid. There's loads of ways you can get cheap infantry. So if people are able to get the models together and get practice with them, I think what we could see is Guard becomes, like, a secondary gatekeeper, like a bit of a doorman. Rather than the gatekeeper, Knights are always going to be the gatekeeper because you've got that, do you have enough anti-tank in your list to kill a Knight a turn or two Baby Knights turn? If yes, your list is okay. If no, go back to the drawing board. That's like how Knights have always been the gatekeeper. But I feel like Infantry Guard could be a doorman. Maybe after the gatekeeper. Maybe a secondary gatekeeper of some kind. And you've got to ask yourself, can you kill two Infantry Blobs a turn? If you can, and that's assuming you've got the AP and the way to get past the fire at Feel No Pain. Can you kill two Death Core Creek Blobs a turn? Do you have enough anti infantry in your list to do that? If you do, then you're fine. You can carry on. If you don't, you have to go back to the drawing board. I don't think what I would say is so powerful about the Death Core and about the pure infantry list, and it's not just Death Core, it's all the different bits working together, is that most people have got away for a real long time with just relying on their spare firepower to do the anti-infantry their incidental firepower their spare bolters and little bits here and there i don't think you can do that anymore i think that after this tournament i got hit by many many a bolt around and it basically did nothing the bolters aren't sufficient anti-infantry a bolter and bolter equivalent and what i found was people were having to dedicate really punchy weapons against the Krieg, but the punchier a weapon, by and large, not always, but by and large, the volume tends to come down. And so it takes more of that punchy weapon to achieve the same volume. And so it's kind of like a catch-22 for your opponent. You've got to use like anti-tank and anti-vehicle weapons on the infantry, but then you've not got the volume to kill more than two squads at once. The one area I think this list is, is, is weak is Blast. And what this list might do, more than anything else, is not force people to fundamentally rewrite their lists, but if they're taking weapons that aren't blast, maybe they're going to start including units that do have blast. Because I found that even when someone was shooting like a cyclone missile launcher at me, they'd roll the number of shots, and then they'd be like, okay, so that's like seven shots. And I'd be like, fine, and then you get plus four. They're like, what do you mean I get plus four? Like, it's blast, i got 20 guys in the squad, you get plus four. That's command squad, so you get plus five on that one. So I think this does have a bit of an Achilles with Blast, but there's not a lot of armies. Every army has access to a bit of Blast, but not every army has access to Blast spam. And so there's still going to be some armies that I think could struggle into this. But like I said, I don't think this is going to be a tournament GT. I'm not, I'm not certain it'd be like a super major winning list. Uh, I think it could definitely win RTTs. I think it could definitely win some GTs. And I think it's going to be more of a meta influencer than becoming the meta. People are going to have to bring enough anti-infantry and it might if this list becomes common enough. And that's the key thing. People won't adapt to it if it only comes up once every so often. But if every tournament you're kind of guaranteed to come across someone using a list like this or an equivalent, I think what it will force the meta to do is bring more blast. But of course, all of that is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Do you think that Pure Infantry Guard has a place in the top tier competitive meta? Do you think that there are armies out there that can easily sweep aside two or three blobs a turn? Do you want to see more tournament reports like this? Where else do you want me to take the Pure Infantry Guard? And do you have any other ideas for crazy army lists that I can take to tournaments? I've got a Nid army. I've got 200 Black Templars. Morden Glory is the home of the Horde. So if you've got other lists that you want me to run, let me know and I'll do my best to take them to an event. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you have done, make sure you smash that like button. And of course, 
subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty so a massive thank you to bon bon vert ken star mark panconi rj scorpion swordfish trombone john stubbs nick walsh diesel fox and august varney thank you guys from the bottom of my heart you are incredible your generosity is truly humbling and i could just say a thousand times over and over again thank you thank you Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.